So this video is for those of you who might be taking physics with calculus. And there's two fundamental areas of calculus that you need to understand. Derivatives and integration. Now just to review, let's say if you want to find the derivative of x to the n with respect to x. Using the power rule, it's equal to n times x raised to the n minus 1. So for instance, let's say if you wish to find the derivative of x to the fifth power. It's going to be 5x to the 5 minus 1, which is 5x to the fourth. Now some of you might already know this, but for those of you who don't, this is just a, a quick refresher. So let's say if we want to find the derivative of x to the seventh power. You could try this if you want to, but it's going to be 7x to the 7 minus 1, which is 7x to the 6th power. Now what about this one? What is the derivative of 5x to the 8th power? And the 5 is just a constant, so this is 5 times the derivative of x to the 8th power. And the derivative of x to the 8th power is 8x to the 7th power. 5 times 8 is 40, so the final answer is 40x to the 7th power. And so that's a quick and simple way to find the derivative of a function. Now, integration is basically the reverse. The indefinite integral of x to the n is going to be x to the n plus 1 divided by that result and then plus the constant of integration. Anytime you differentiate a constant, you get 0. So when you integrate, you're going to introduce a constant. So let's put this into practice. What is the antiderivative, or the indefinite integral, of x cubed dx? So this is going to be x to the 3 plus 1 divided by 3 plus 1 plus c. So this ends up being x to the 4th divided by 4 plus c. And so you can write that as 1 4th x to the 4th plus c. Now let's try another example. Let's find the indefinite integral of 7x to the 5th power. So for this example, you could take the constant and move it to the front. So this is the same as 7 times the integral of x to the 5th power dx. Now using the power rule for integration, the antiderivative of x to the 5th is x to the 6th divided by 6 and then plus c. So our final answer is 7. You can say 7 over 6 times x to the 6 plus c. Now I want to talk about the relationship between derivatives and division with that of integration and multiplication. So in physics, sometimes you may have a simple formula to deal with. Other times the formula might involve calculus. For instance, work is the product of force and displacement. Now, displacement could be in the x direction, or it could be in the y direction. In the x direction, displacement, you could simply call it x. In the y direction, it's really just y. Well, technically, it's the change in x or the change in y. Because displacement is the final position minus the initial position. It could be along the x-axis or along the y-axis. So whenever you see d, it represents displacement. Now, this formula should be applied if the force acting on an object, that is the net force, is constant. But what if the net force is not constant? What if it varies based on the displacement of the object? What if it changes? In this case, you need to use calculus. Whenever something is not constant, you, you need to use calculus to get the answer. Notice that the force is being multiplied by the displacement. It turns out that the work done by a variable force is the integral of that force, or let's say that force is a function of the displacement along the x direction times dx. Now you're going to integrate it from a to b. So a and b will be like 
and x value. Basically, x1 will be the initial position, x2 is your final position. But what I want you to realize is that when you have a formula, if you're multiplying two variables, that formula is going to be associated with integration. When you're dividing two variables, that formula will be associated with differentiation or derivatives. So let me give you another example. Average velocity, which I'm going to represent like this, is basically the change in position or the displacement over time. So we're dividing displacement and time. So this formula is going to be associated with derivatives. It turns out that the instantaneous velocity as a function of time is the derivative of the position function with respect to time. So as you can see, you need to associate division with differentiation and associate multiplication with integration. Now let's see if you got the point that I'm trying to make. Let's start with a familiar formula. In your physics textbook, you'll see this formula. Final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus acceleration. Now, with this formula, there's a lot of things we can do. Here's one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to move the initial velocity to the other side. So I have v final minus v initial is equal to at. Now, this represents the change in velocity. So I'm going to represent that as delta v, where delta means change. So I get this formula. The change in velocity is equal to the acceleration multiplied by the time. Now let's save that formula. We'll talk about it later. Now starting from the original formula that we have, let's solve for a. So I'm going to move this to this side. So once again, I have v final minus v initial equals at. And then dividing by t, I have that the acceleration is v final minus v initial over t. And we know this is the change of velocity, so we could say that delta v over, I guess you could say delta t, this t is really delta t, is equal to a. So looking at these two formulas, which one is associated with derivatives and which one is associated with integration? So let's say if we're focused on this formula. If the acceleration is constant, you can just use this formula to calculate the change in velocity. But let's say if the acceleration is not constant, let's say it's a variable. Would you use integration or differentiation to calculate the change in velocity? Notice that we're multiplying a by t. So that's going to be associated with integration. Thus, the change in velocity will be the integral of the acceleration function, where a depends on t, from t1 to t2, from an initial time point to a final time point. Now let's think about what this means. If we have a graph with the acceleration in the y direction and time in the x direction, now let's say the acceleration is variable, we can calculate the change in velocity of the object, let's say from t1 to t2 or from a to b, by finding the area under the curve. Now sometimes you could use geometry to find the area under the curve. Other times you have to use calculus for a shape like this. But what you want to take from this is that the area under this curve highlighted in blue represents the change in velocity. Likewise, if we go back to the other function where we said that work is the definite integral of the force when it's a function of x, if we graph this, where f is on the y-axis, the displacement is on the x-axis, and let's say the force is a variable function, 
if we integrate it from A, let's say to B, the area represented by the shaded region is equal to the work done by the net force. So this is just not any force, but it represents the sum of the forces acting on the object or the net force. So make sure you keep that in mind. The area under the curve is associated with integration, which is also associated with multiplication. When you wish to find the area of an object, let's say a rectangle, it's length times width. You're multiplying the length and the width. Now let's talk about this other formula. Acceleration is the change in velocity divided by the change in time. So here we're dealing with division. So this tells us that acceleration is the derivative of velocity. It's the instantaneous rate of change of the velocity function. So if you wish to find the acceleration function, all you need to do is differentiate the velocity function with respect to time. Now, let's draw a graph. Now let's say this is the acceleration on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. Actually, let's use velocity. So velocity on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. And let's say the velocity is just, it varies. It's not constant. If you wish to find the acceleration from the velocity, you need to find the slope of the tangent line. So let's say we want to find the acceleration at, let me use a different shape. Let's say at this point. To find the acceleration at that point, what you need to do is calculate the slope of the tangent line. And you could find that using derivatives. The tangent line is a line that touches the point at only, it touches the curve at only one point. The secant line touches the curve at two points. So this is a secant line. So keep that in mind. A secant line touches the curve at two points. A tangent line touches the curve at one point. The secant line represents an average rate of change. The tangent line represents an instantaneous rate of change. If you wish to find a slope between two points, you could use this formula. The slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So this represents the average rate of change. So if you wish to find the average acceleration, you can use a similar formula. But instead of y, you're going to be using velocity. v final minus v initial. And instead of x, you're going to be using time. t2 minus t1. So to calculate the average acceleration from velocity, all you need is two points. The initial velocity at the initial time and the final velocity at that final time. Now to calculate the instantaneous acceleration, you need to use derivatives. So the instantaneous acceleration is going to be the derivative of the velocity function at some time t. So we should really write A of t here. So this right here represents the instantaneous acceleration. And this here represents the average acceleration. 